Hello, good afternoon and welcome to the Department of Biochemistry at the University of Cambridge in the UK. I'm Dr. Rhys Grant and I am the Science Communication Specialist here in the Biochemistry Department, shared also with the Cell and Molecular Biology Programme at the Cancer Research UK Cambridge Centre at Cambridge University. So I'm extremely pleased to welcome you to our department this afternoon for this live talk as part of the 2021 Cambridge Festival, which aims to bring the research of the University of Cambridge directly to you in your living room, your office, your garden, or wherever it is that you're watching us from today. So for this talk, I am joined by Dr. Jonathan Gadsby, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the Wellcome Trust Cancer Research UK Gurdon Institute in Cambridge. And today, Jonathan's going to be speaking to us about the variety of roles played by the Actin Network and how this can contribute to and can be targeted in different diseases. I'm also joined by Latika Sigumba, who is part of our department's secretariat team. And Latika is going to be helping me out behind the scenes today with running this afternoon's talk. But before we get on to any of the awesome science and learning about the Actin Network, the first thing we'd like you all to please do is click the subscribe button down below to follow our YouTube channel, because we've got more talks coming up this week for the Cambridge Festival, and we're planning on bringing you more live content direct from our department in the near future. I'd also like to encourage you all to please check out our other social media channels after Jonathan's talk is finished though, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and so on, using our handle at CamBioChem. So that's C-A-M-B-I-O-C-H-E-M, because we use these channels to tell you about all of the news, the research, the teaching, outreach, events, everything really that goes on in our department. Just to let you know, after Jonathan's talk, Jonathan, Latika and myself will be taking part in a live question and answer session. So if you have any questions on Jonathan's talk, or maybe if you're just wondering a bit about what life is like as a postdoctoral researcher, if you could please post your questions in the live chat on YouTube, and then the three of us will stay around for 15, 20 minutes after Jonathan's talk to answer as many of these as we can get through. For the Q&A session, it will just be me reading your questions out anonymously on your behalf. So you don't need to worry about being seen on camera if you're currently chilling out on the sofa, eating your lunch whilst watching this. So as I mentioned, this afternoon's talk is going to be given by Dr. Jonathan Gadsby, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the Wellcome Trust Cancer Research UK Gurdon Institute in Cambridge. So Jonathan began his career studying molecular biology at Durham University, and then he undertook his PhD at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, where he was examining microtubule organization in cancer. In 2015, Jonathan moved to Cambridge, where he joined Dr. Jenny Gallup's research group, which is based in the Gurdon Institute and affiliated with our department. Jonathan has been at the Gurdon Institute as a postdoctoral researcher ever since, and his current research is focused on actin, and particularly how this can assemble at trafficking vesicles, with his most recent work looking into how this process can go wrong in a rare inherited disease. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Jonathan to start this afternoon's talk. So thank you very much, Jonathan. Thanks, Rhys, and uh, well, hello everyone, uh, at least virtually out there in the, in the ether somewhere. Um, yeah, so today um, I'm going to talk about actin. What exactly is it? Why do I spend all my days looking down at it microscopes? What makes it interesting and why is it so important? Uh, and hopefully by the end of it, you'll have some understanding of that and, and sort of why this particular protein is one of the most critical components of the cell. But let's start there and um, just remind ourselves what we're all we're on the cellular level here. So what exactly are the cells? These are these building blocks of life. So there are 30 trillion. That's what that many zeros mean at the end of a at the end of a number. There are 30 trillion cells in the average human. And hopefully you've all previously in the past seen sort of a, a schematic like this that illustrates the basic components of, in this case, an animal cell. So you have a membrane which is encompassing the contents of the cell. So that's uh, a lipid membrane um, with the internal volume mostly filled with the cytoplasm. And in that cytoplasm, um, you have all the different organelles which help the cell do its various functions. So you have the nucleus here, which is where all the genetic material is kept and organized. So the DNA, etc. 
you have um, the sort of folds of membrane called the endoplasmic retic reticulum, which is where critical molecular synthesis happens. So these are like the factories of the cell uh, synthesizing other proteins and um, carbohydrates and components such as that. Uh, and then you have really important um, trafficking um, organelles such as vesicles, which are the actual um, small things that move uh, and transport things around the cell, uh, and the Golgi, which sorts them all out. And then things like mitochondria, which are critical for energy production. So all cells will have these components. However, they're not as simple um, as just this basic schematic. And um, as you can see here, all of these are composed of basically the same components, but they can form so many different uh, forms of functions um, depending on what they need to do. Um, so just to go through some of these, um, these neurons, for example, these are all about the transmitting of um, signals from through in the brain and the nervous system. So you have the signaling inputting at one end and it needs to be transferred, transmitted across vast distances sometimes to either other neurons to continue the pathway or um, to control the muscles, for example, at the end um, of, of their processes to make you actually move your hands or something like that. So these have to take on this form, which is long and thin, able to um, cover vast distances and transmit these electrical potentials. In contrast, uh, the muscles, these have to be organized completely differently. As you can see from this, it looks completely different. These have been assembled into these fibers of repeated contractile units to allow muscles to contract like that, either in the heart or um, your skeletal muscles that move your bones and your body. Um, and they take on this really characteristic, striated appearance of this, really these repeated contractile units, which you can see here in the sarcomere. Um, and mentioned the mitochondria, the energy factory, there's loads of those that surround these. That's what these purple um, colors are over here. Completely different from what the neurons look like. Oops, look like uh, and, and then you have, um, again, completely different, you have um, epithelial tissue. So these are, this is the outer layer that lines things such as the gut or the kidney or anything where the outside of the body, so if in this context, things you've ingested are still effectively outside you um, in terms of whether you've absorbed any of them into yourself. So these are critical, they line tissues and they provide a physical barrier whilst also critically allowing transport of small molecules and signals. So you can see that if I blow up on this schematic, you have a vast, uh, very complex array of junctions which keeps that physical barrier and keeps the epithelial secure to prevent just any old thing uh, flowing in. And then you have important trafficking um, processes which help that directional transport of so small molecules and signals either into the cell or out the other way. And so these take on these really polarized is what it's called. Um, so you have a very distinct top surface and bottom surface. It's all about transport through. So as you can see, there's loads of these cells all specialize according to what they need to do. Um, and that's so critically important and actually one of those things that helps do that. But just to help give a bit, a bit more perspective, I want to talk a little bit about the sense of scale of where we are, what size are we talking about when we're thinking about cells and also the components inside them. So every time we go down uh, a unit here, basically, we're getting a thousand times smaller. So you can all imagine what the difference between a meter and a millimeter is. And then in the world of microscopy and the world of the cell, we're then starting to go a thousand times smaller than that into the micrometer territory, which is what this little symbol is, and then the nanometer. So to give some examples, we all know roughly what the size of a head is. It's about 15 to 20 centimeters wide or about just slightly wider than a typical ruler that you might have had in your pencil case at school. Then if you think then sort of down to a thousand times smaller than that, you have the single hair strand um, from a head. That's about the smallest thing that the human eye can actually see out live. So you can hopefully imagine how big those are. If we then go down into those epithelial cells that were lining the gut, they're about 20 micrometers in height. So that's um, roughly actually a fifth, say, of the width of this hair strand. So no, you can't necessarily see that. This is when we start needing microscopy to be able to see things, whereas the nucleus of those cells then is four times smaller than that, about five micrometers. You then think about bacteria. So they, this is E. coli, that's about two micrometers in length. So if you imagine on the nucleus, it would be about that long there. And then a virus such as the flu virus, 
uh, is even much smaller than that. We're now down into the nanometer range, so 500 times smaller than these bacterium. And then actual protein complexes themselves. Um, so this um, is a seven protein complex. So there are seven proteins in this, and this is 10 nanometers in diameter. So that's um, say a tenth of this virus. You can imagine therefore just how small we're now starting to get in terms of these machines that help us all function, uh, et cetera. Uh, studying these things that are down in the 50, 10, 50, 100 nanometer range, you start needing complicated uh, equipment such as electron microscopy and structural biology. But what I spend a lot of the time on is at this sort of scale, looking um, at these uh, 20 micron two sort of thing, working out where things are within a cell. And for that, we still use light microscopy. And this is very similar to the sort of microscopy you would have done at school. And um, these are all based on the same principles and the same sort of equipment. Um, and pretty much we just use complicated versions of that for this. So historically, this light microscopy uh, really properly began in 1665 with Robert Hooke. People had looked down microscope and objected and things before that, but he was the first one that started thinking about it more in a scientific way and actually recording what he saw. So this is his microscope and the basic principles are the same today. Um, of course, he didn't have a camera to go at the top of it. He had to report his findings literally by drawing them. This is his drawing of the cork that he put under the microscope to see. And the, every single one of these is, a, is basically the remains of a plant cell. So that's what he was able to see with his equipment. Now, today's machines are much more complicated, but the exact same thing is um, the same in principle. You have a light source that um, you have, uh, that you focus onto your specimen, and then you have object magnification objective lenses that allow you to then see it. And now, of course, we don't have to draw our findings anymore, which is very lucky for me because that would not go well. Um, I'm able to take all my pictures on a uh, digital camera system. So that's the basics of how effectively I'm going to be studying acting. But um, there's how do we get these pretty colours, you may be wondering, um, to, of all these different things. And that story begins much more in much more modern times, but still quite a while ago. So it's all based um, on the discovery of a protein called GFP, which means green fluorescence protein, um, by a scientist called Samu Shimamura back in 1962. Um, why this protein is so great for us as scientists is basically how it works. It's a bio, it's from the bioluminescent jellyfish. And if you excite it with a certain wavelength of light, uh, in this case, UV light, it will emit green light in this case. And you can see that here in the jellyfish itself. Now, why was this was so important was because it was a protein that science, we as scientists could harness. Uh, and in 1992 to 1994, um, Martin Chalfrey and his colleagues worked out how you could express this protein in another organism so we could now transfer it out into systems we might be interested in and also how to genetically tag it onto something that we might be interested in. So in our case we would want to have this tag onto actin so we could see where the actin was and what it was doing because if you can do that you can allow its location to be visualized and also you can look at it live and see exactly what it's doing and what structures it's forming. Uh, and then also at a similar sort of time in 1994, Roger Tian, another, uh, another scientist, worked out how to generate alternative versions of this that could be excited in a different wavelengths and emit different colors of light. And that's critical for us because it means that we can allow more than one protein to be tagged at once so we can see how things, how the location of different proteins interact with each other and therefore work out what they're doing. Uh, and just to so show just in fact how important this finding was that allows us to now really get into the depths of this. In 2008, um, all three of these scientists were awarded the Nobel Prize together for these discoveries. It's such a critically important uh, discovery for, for, for what I do now. So just to summarise it, um, we've now got loads of different fluorophores, so we can tag loads of different things. You can see the different fluorescences here in this uh, array of test tubes. And basically how the modern systems work is uh, you have a light source, uh, so basically playing around with lasers, safely of course. Um, you, you shine light of a specific wavelength, um, depending on what tag you've got. Um, onto your protein of interest and it emits it and then you have the detector so uh, we can see where everything is so to put it more succinctly we have the lights we have the camera 
And now we have the acting. And in this image, we have both acting and some friends as well. And I'll explain that a little bit now. So acting is part of something called the cytoskeleton. It augments and animates the cell. Um, so it's the thing that helps the cell take on these different uh, um, specialised morphologies that I showed you earlier. Um, it helps it organise it into those. It helps it interact with that environment uh, and connect it to its outside world. So, as I mentioned, there are three different filamentous networks. In, in this image, the actin itself is actually the one that's shown in white. You can see it here more around the periphery. And then you've got a couple of other networks um, called microtubules and intermediate filaments which are shown in these different colours. You can also see how this is here is a dividing cell. You can see how that these are all essential for that process as well. Uh, like our ability to grow and uh, is dependent on these as well. So cytoskeleton is absolutely critical. Uh, it helps us generate and coordinate the forces that allow those movements and shape changes. So here is an example of that. This is uh, going to, I'm going to show this movie in a second. This is a wound healing response in um, fish skin. So just over here to the right, uh, a wound is going to be made. Uh, and what you'll see when I show the movie is how these cells, which are currently organized as a, a nice skin layer, um, are going to completely reorganize to allow them to respond to that wound. I'll play the movie now and you can see complete reorganization that allows them to move off here to the right side in response to that signal that they've detected from their outside world. So I mentioned there were three different uh, filamentous networks. I'm just going to explain the other two as well briefly. So you have firstly microtubules, these are the largest of the three. Uh, they're dynamic as you can see from this animation as they assemble and disassemble. And what they're particularly important for them is they form uh, a cellular motorway. Um, you can see here, this is a motor protein, which is using the microtubule as a track to transport some cargo. Um, so these are really important within the cell for moving things around. Um, and just to show that in uh, real world ones, this is just the very bottom of a epithelial monolith. So this is at the bottom um, of that uh, lining of the gut that I talked about earlier. And you can see here the microtubules are in this magenta colour. You can just see moving along them, the little blue dots are the cargo that are being transported, in this case, to the bottom of this monolayer, where they will then be taken up into the rest of the body uh, from, from this point of view. The second one uh, are called intermediate filaments. Uh, from their name, you can sort of work out, they're called intermediate filaments because they're the medium one in terms of size. And they're particularly important for structural support. So you can see how they help to link cells together um, through junctional proteins. And this helps with mechanical structure. So uh, a little bit like the bones of our full skeleton, these are helping keep us all, uh, keep the cells in a nice organized formation. And then the one that I'm most interested in, the one I really want to talk about today is actin, of course. And this one is the one that is driving those cell shape changes and movement. So uh, you remember this wound healing response I just showed a few moments ago? Well, what this, uh, what is shown in white here is actually actin doing this reorganization process, responding to that wound, moving the cells. Um, what that is what has been, in this case, we talked about GFP, the GFP, tag protein here is acting. You can see just how dynamic it is, how it can be rapidly molded into this a diverse set of structures. So this is the front of, of a, a moving cell, a little bit like those ones in, in that epithelial monolayer. And you can see just how much this actin is rapidly rearranged at the leading edge of this, sending out these protrusions. Um, and it's also really important for exerting contractile forces, as I'll talk about a bit at the end. So to think about it another way, actin is a bit like Lego. Um, it is rapidly assembled and also disassembled. You take out each little block and then you can reassemble it into something that looks a little bit different. In this case, a bag of chips, but in our world, different um, networks, different formations that do different things for the cell. So how is it able to do all of this? Why, what makes it so flexible? Why is it so particularly key uh, for setting up these different networks, allowing these different things to, have, to form? And it's all down to its basic natural dynamics. So 
The basic unit of actin is uh, a single protein um, called globular or G-actin, which is, you can see it here, um, in, in just this is a single glo globular actin that's not yet assembled. But what's key to it is that it polymerizes. It's able to assemble into these filaments, which you can see here, a filament that's going to be assembled. And why it's so naturally flexible, why it's so naturally dynamic, is that this filament as it assembles has two very distinct ends. Um, this end where subunits are added uh, is called the barbed end and it has had a slightly different shape to the other end, which is called the pointed end. And the reason why this is critical is that it's so much, it, because of the, these shape changes, it's much easier to add subunits onto that barbed end whereas at the other end, they tend to be lost. So I'm just gonna show the animation which shows this happening. You can see here, the subunit's being readily added at the barbed end and lost here at the pointed end. And what you can see from that is that this means that naturally actin wants to push against something. As you can see, the whole, there's a whole exertion of force going this way uh, as this process happens. Of course, it's not just uh, all about its own natural dynamics. It can then be further regulated by a whole vast array of accessory proteins. So if we're going back to our Lego analogy, these are a little bit like the brick separators, which help separate the thing you made and uh, allow you to build something else. And there are a vast array of different accessory proteins that can do different things. Um, one example is the ARP23 complex. Now, if you remember back at the start, I showed how this was a seven protein complex that was sort of, in that um, 10 nanometer width. Um, this is critically important. It's a, what this does is it helps to assemble the new filaments off the side of an existing one to help generate a branch network. So I'm gonna show the movie because that shows it best. Here is an existing filament that's been assembled. And this here is the R23 complex, which is bound to it and has allowed another filament to form off the side. And you can imagine as that repeatedly happens, you get a large network uh, that's able to build up. And one really nice example of this actually is um, um, the vaccinia virus, for example. This is a virus which, when it infects the cell, it exploits this ARP23 complex naturally from the cell to allow it to move around and therefore spread itself and reinfect uh, neighboring cells. And it does this, it, it, it's exploiting this ARP23 complex and its ability to form branch net network, net, actin network to push itself. And I'll show that again in the movie, you can see how all of the little branches form off to the side and allow it to push. And this movie just shows some examples of those acting comet tails here in red off the back of the vaccine, which is in blue. And you can see how it allows them to really move around the cell. Uh, now, this same process is, is also what is happening when you we're seeing those protrusions of membrane naturally in the most migrating cells pushing forward. It's all about its ability to, to exert a pushing force on something, either a virus in this case, or the external membrane of the cell to allow things to move. Oh, sorry, everything wants to play again. So, with trying to now apply this to disease process. So actin is vital and it impacts on so many different cellular functions. And we want to understand it to both understand those normal cellular processes, but also to help understand what goes wrong in disease. So there's an example there of it being exploited in, in a viral infection. Um, but there's so many other uh, places where this is key and important. And if we're going to understand both the normal processes and also when those normal processes get, go wrong, it helps us to identify targets and potential pathways for treatment. So, for example, uh, a very unusual experience happened in the middle of last year in that um, me and uh, the, the other people in our group got excited by an article in the Daily Mail, which is somewhat unusual. Uh, in, in this point of view, it was um, talking about COVID, which is the reason why you can see my back wall and rather than a lecture theatre at the moment. So uh, this was just a, a very small story, but um, very interesting to us. Um, and it was exploring how COVID to help itself spread um, can uh, increase the number and increase the formation of these little um, uh, projections outside of the cell. Now these are called phylopodia and they're actin rich projections that are, um, leading out. Now, um, 
I probably wouldn't describe them as tentacle uh, and um, loaded with viral venom, but what they're doing here is the it's helping to allow potentially the COVID to spread. Um, now, from a disease point of view, therefore, can we target these phylopodia, which are, are acting rich as potentials for an antiviral um, in the future? So as an example of, of sort of a, a modern day thing, that's where these things can be interesting. Uh, it's also a very key actin, particularly, it's very a very key part of cancer and the, the ability of cancers to spread. So the reorganization of actin is crucial in something called the epithelial mesenchymal transition, EMT. Um, that is where junctions break down and the cells adopt a migratory or invasive phenotype. So you can see we talked earlier about how these epithelial cells were very nicely organized. They were tightly bound to each other. They were critical for maintaining this proper barrier and um, their function. What uh, happens in cancer is that they lose this distinct phenotype and they start developing this more migratory invasive phenotype. And that is what helps allow them to spread. And this is actually the exact same process that's happening with wound healing. So EMT is not in itself a bad thing. It is a critical part of when we're developing um, um, as, a, as a embryo, as a, as, a, as a baby. EMT is one of the things that means that we correctly uh, develop uh, our human body. Um, and it's also this wound healing response is an example of this process working well. We need to be able to do that. Obviously, in cancer, what happens is that this starts happening um, abnormally. Um, and, and that's what allows this more ability to move and migrate to happen. But that means because acting is such a critical part of it, we can start looking to see whether we can uh, target any pathways that are crucial for that migration and invasion, pro and invasion process. And a, a, a process called uh, trying to target migrostatic, stopping migration from happening if we can. Uh, and there's been uh, a lot of um, drugs will be trying to looking at trying to target some of these different processes. So either by destabling or stabilizing actin in itself, as those are two examples of what people have tried to do, or targeting some of those networks and pathways that are either directly interacting with the actin and helping mold its um, structures or interrupting the signaling process that, that are signaling it to do this. Um, and the early steps of drug development will often be looking, um, particularly for cancer, of, of, of trying to stop this migration process happening. So uh, we can model that wound healing response in the lab at a very basic level by growing cells in a dish and then scratching them and then seeing if we can close the wound. And this is the sort of experiment that will be very early on in many um, anti-migration uh, pipelines for drug development. Uh, and here's an example of one that, uh, that works. You can see here uh, how much this wound closes um, um, in a cancerous model and how much that has been slowed down by, in this case, a drug called apelicid. And this one has now since gone on to be approved to treat metastatic breast cancer. And from this point of view, it's the one I wanted to highlight because it's also one that I've been using in my work for a completely different purpose. Um, uh, as Rhys mentioned at the start, um, I've been looking at um, a very rare disease called Low Syndrome and uh, DENT2 disease, which are, are both caused by uh, the, the same issue, effectively. Uh, so I've been looking um, at the kidney, and this is where we're coming back to this trafficking. So the purpose uh, of the kidney is to, uh, particularly the um, proximal tubule, uh, which is the bit just after the filtration unit of the kidney, it's to reabsorb things that would otherwise be lost. So just after um, we, the, the kidney filtration step happens, actually what gets lost in that would be a lot of things that we actually don't want to lose. Um, so the cell has a, has, um, a group of cells, um, epithelial cells, which is specifically designed to try and reuptake small molecules and uh, other um, small, um, compo uh, small uh, components that are useful in that cell line. And it's all part of, um, it has a very healthy trafficking system of taking things up from the outside and bringing them through. And this uh, initial take up involves actin. There's a very short burst of actin and you can 
If you look closely, you can just see little appearances, for example, little black dots of actin appearing and disappearing. Um, and that, what that's doing is helping these vesicles move away from the outer membrane and therefore get involved in this trafficking system as a whole. And it's very similar to what the, vi the, the vaccine the virus is doing on a much smaller scale. It's that little short burst that helps, in this case, it's short and then immediately stops, but it just helps that vesicle be pushed away. However, what goes wrong um, um, in these rare diseases is that we lose control over that short acting polymerization process. Uh, and instead it persists. And this means that we get excess actin pushing these vesicles around, which you can see in this uh, movie here. Now it starts looking really like those vaccine viruses that are being pushed around. Now we don't want it to be doing this because it's preventing it from getting into the rest of this trafficking pathway. And that means that instead of actually properly being reabsorbed, things are just getting stuck and these pathway becomes blocked. And unfortunately for the patients that eventually leads to kidney failure. Um, uh, we, and so that's how the disease is caused. Uh, and what I was able to do, um, and what as part of uh, when our group and also with our collaborators, is use this anti-cancer drug as it was designed to be to help rescue those excess actin effects. You can see it really nicely here. When we add the drug and, and also um, related compounds to it, um, we can really reduce that amount of actin comets that are excessively pushing things around but not actually usefully taking things up. Um, in case you're wondering what the move that what the picture on the very front cover of this talk was, um, that is um, actually these movies um, color coded just pasting every single image on top of each other um, according to the time it was taken in, uh, in a different color. So that's how those pictures were generated. It's helping to try and show uh, in non-movie form uh, how these comets uh, a form and how they can be reduced in this case by uh, this um, this drug. Uh, and for, we've further gone on to have a look at this and we've done some initial studies in mice which has shown that this ability to rescue this excess actin also helps rescue some of those kidney uptake problems and uh, hopefully we'll be able to take this on in the future. Now this was particularly important for a disease like low syndrome DENT2 this is exceedingly rare. It's about one in 500,000 people that have this. So um, being able to reuse a cancer drug for this purpose, it will be very hard for companies to um, design a specific drug for this because it affects not that many people. But if we can repurpose, in this case, a, an anti-cancer drug for that and show, uh, in this case, we're exploiting this rescue on this excess actin effect, uh, we can hopefully, if it, if it works, it may well be useful for further treatment. Um, so I also just wanted to finish with exploring actin in muscles, because uh, a lot of what I've talked about so far is actin pushing against something, um, be it uh, pushing things around the cell or pushing against um, a membrane to allow move cellular movement to happen. Um, but it's also critically important in muscles and this ability for it to develop contraction. So I just want to uh, show this is a movie of muscles developing. And what you'll start to see is the formation of these um, contractile structures. You can see here the little green lines separating every single structure. Um, and what that green line actually is, is a companion protein to actin, actin allowing it to form called, oops, called myosin. So what these um, structures actually are, are a central um, thick filament of, of myosin surrounded by this cage-like uh, array lattice of uh, predominantly actin uh, thin filaments is what they're called. And this works because this myosin, uh, it has, you can see these little uh, heads here and those, are able to bind onto the actin and pull on it, and that allows this contraction to happen. Um, as you can imagine, it's effectively the myosin is able to exert a force and pull, allowing this cage to form. Uh, and, and, to, and therefore, and then we can release to go back the other way, and that allows these contractions to happen. And perhaps the best way of showing that is in this movie again. 
here you've got again the myosin in this pinky color and you can see these heads moving and pulling pulling these actin filaments along um, so that's how contraction happens it's this sinking of these two different filaments together and you can that all uh, allows these muscle contractions to happen in, in, in these embryos that um, you saw earlier developing. This is the final form and you can see how they uh, push and pull as they um, to exert that contraction. And again, um, this can um, go wrong in, in, in several uh, diseases with a range of severity and there's a bunch of um, are called actinopathies and these are actually caused by mutations in actin itself and have a, a range of severity depending on uh, where exactly what it's disrupting but it causes muscle weakness and, and lesions and you can see that here as proteins aggregate within the structure thereby severely weakening its, weakening its ability to properly uh, exert these forces uh, and it's all these uh, can also cause similar symptoms with this actin is also surrounded by several other interacting proteins which are a key part of, 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 these, of this structure and you get similar symptoms when any of these are also um, mutated. As yet for this um, sort of thing the treatments are very restricted to managing the symptoms um, and here is where there is something of an issue of directly targeting actin is that it's so key to so many different processes that when you directly try and target a treatment at actin itself, that's quite a toxic thing to do because the actin is required for so many other processes in the cell. But it's also why this study of how it's working is so important because um, if we can understand what it's interacting with, what other components there are, we can design treatments that can target specific things that are wrong in the disease uh, and specific ways around it. Um, so basically it's all about this is the key question, why do I research actin? Why is it so important? It's this diversity of its roles, the fact that it's so essential for cell function, and the fact that because of that, it impacts on multiple diseases. Multiple diseases. And if we can understand that, we can provide a toolbox, pathways and possibilities for how we may go about um, treating diseases in which it's relevant and in which uh, it, it can have a, an impact and have a role. And the final reason why is because it's dynamic and it looks really good. And these are just some examples from both myself and Middle and also some others of just acting structures that are just beautiful to look at and really pretty. So um, uh, hopefully that's introduced um, this to you. And thank you very much for listening. I'd like to thank everybody in the group um, and our collaborators and of course, the, the Gurdon Department of Chemi Biochemistry and, and our fundings. And I say, I hope that made you interested in, in what it is and explained a little bit about why it's so important. And uh, if you have any questions, I, I guess that's what we're, we're now here for. So I hope you enjoyed. Great, thank you very much, Jonathan. That was, that was a really, really interesting talk. Um, so as Jonathan has just mentioned, we're now gonna have our live question and answer session. If you have any questions, if you could post these in the live chat on YouTube, and then we'll try and answer as many of these as we can get through. Uh, there is a 20 second delay though, between what we're saying on Zoom and you hearing us on YouTube. So that means uh, I get to ask the first question. Um, so Jonathan, your, your movies are beautiful. I, I love fluorescence microscopy, but your movies are amazing. Um, so I'm just wondering, how long does it take to make those films? So the... the ones that I was doing there, they're actually only about five minutes. Um, that's how quickly these things are moving around the cell. So, uh, th so the ones of the, the comets um, um, for, for my, uh, in the low syndrome example I was doing, um, they are five minutes and the frames are taken every two to, uh, I think it's every two seconds. So as rapidly as I can get it, because I want to capture all of this movement. Um, so it's yeah that's how dynamic these things are um, that example of the muscle development i showed very at the very end there um, that takes that's just 15 minutes to go from the unstructured to the formation of those contractile units during development as a slightly different example but these are all very quick processes it's it's um, amazing just how 
it, it, you can almost have to think about uh, proteins as sort of little machines and how quickly they can interact and bump into each other and quickly form and dissociate and form what they need to do. It, it's an amazing process and, and it's why we need to, um, the more we can improve our technology to take better pictures, even better as well. It is really impressive just how dynamic the inside of a cell is. I mean, yeah. thinking back to school when you're kind of first taught about the cell, the cytoplasm, the membrane, the nucleus, it always seems quite static when you're first introduced to it. Then in seeing it in this, uh, with this microscopy, it's extremely dynamic and beautiful. And um, I guess it's a sort of related question that how do you get the GFP into your cells? And uh, you mentioned the tag. I'm just wondering if you could explain what you what you mean by that. Yeah, so um, effectively, um, for every protein, we, we know the genetic sequence of it. And we also know the genetic sequence of the tag. And uh, well, there are lots of tools which allow us to snip those genetic codes from one place to another. Uh, and, and, and therefore, um, with a sufficient um, uh, uh, accuracy, we can put the genetic code uh, from GFP into a specific place on our protein. We have to be very careful not to put it in a place that would disrupt what we're interested in, what it does. So you have to do some tests to check whether it needs to go on which end it needs to go because they can disrupt natural interactions and that can be an issue. Um, and then we've therefore got, now we've got one long con genetic construct, which is the two different proteins tagged on to basically in the same um, construct together. And we can then uh, transfect in so basically insert that sequence uh, and the cell will take up that genetic material that we've added back and it will translate that and make the protein, but it will make the protein with those two sequences tagged together. Um, so it will keep on going, basically. Uh, so that's how we can get it in. Um, that's really interesting. Um, and then I guess that would then mean that by where you're seeing the GFP, you're effectively seeing that individual molecule. Yeah, that's the idea, is that we are literally, and, and with modern day um, uh, microscopy techniques, we've, we've now got into uh, improvements of computing, et cetera, and, and just general technology allows us to do something called super resolution. And we now get to the point where we are literally tracking single molecules of, uh, single flashes of fluorescence, it allows us to know exactly where a, specific, a single molecule of something is. We know it's not just a rough, pool of something somewhere we're literally following exactly where one molecule or something is and also the, the, there are also uh beyond just the gfp people now developed other smaller fluorescent tags or which can be more accurately put in and out in, in depending on there is modified that basic principle for other purposes and other regions and just uh, as we again get more technology we can do more and more accurate things with this hmm. And there's a question from the audience on YouTube. Um, so do you think there are other roles for actin that are yet to be discovered? Um, uh, it's one of the, so I think the very basic roles of it, the sort of the broad of exactly what it's doing, uh, I think are pretty well known. But it's, as I say, it's one of those things that you probably find has a dip, can dip its finger into many different pies. Um, sort of a, a lot of, pathways might sort of oh actually I can go there's a little interaction down an acting uh, down an acting alleyway uh, sometimes so because it's involved in so many different things I would imagine that yeah there are probably things that oh I am not of trying acting in that or if I that, that so I think that's probably the best is that as you understand it you, just components related to it will crop up in things that we're, we're, we're not so sure about yet so yeah it'll it'll pop up at all over the place I guess because it's involved in, uh, no, actually, I'm not going to ask that question. That's a bit too off topic. <laughs> um, I have another question, though, actually. And um, so I missed the Daily Mail story about uh, COVID-19 and acting, but that looks really interesting. I was wondering, is that a normal way for viruses to spread inside the body by creating uh, these tentacles? Uh, yes, uh, actually. So, so it's known with others. I've, I've forgotten all the specific examples, but yeah. So, so what it's doing in that case is, uh, so phylopodia are a normal thing for cells to have. But what it's doing is it's in basically encouraging the formation of more. And you can imagine that if you've got, if you're one of your purposes to try and spread to your nearby neighbour, if you have um, 
a tentacle that a tentacle uh, yeah let's call it that that's, that, that, that's the, the way to call it if you have more of those it potentially means more ability to interact with nearby neighbors so yeah there's quite a few that exploit things in, in that way and um uh, we've seen it as well with some of our own uh, work where we you, go, you also sometimes have uh, viruses ingressing along phylopodia so hitting the end of them and then coming down into a cell so it's, it, it can be either way but yeah it, it is actually a thing that quite often happens and of course you have the other ones which are pushing themselves around within the cell that i talked about as well the vaccinias and that's very very common and there's, there's a lot that do that i have to check out this this story after this talk because that it looks it's nothing that i've heard of before and it seems interesting so yeah i'm gonna go find that story and have a read uh latika do you have any any questions or anything you want to add um i guess sort of following on from that um, obviously, with the tabloids, they tend to uh, exaggerate and and sort of, well, they pull us in by giving something a bit uh, sensational. Like the word um, tentacles instead of... Yeah. <laughs> and it, it, well, I'm guessing they are quoting uh, whoever it was because they use the term sinister as well. Um, uh, I, I, no, I think that was the, the tabloid version of what the, uh, the, the scientists did behind uh, OK. Um, <laughs> but how, what's the best way to sort of avoid kind of all the, the nonsense that these articles can contain? Where would you say is a better place for people to read up on these kind of things online in plain English? Well, again, there's actually, I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with um, the, the, the newspaper sort of using uh, language that people may find more relevant. I mean, I, I'm sh I don't know whether I have. I, I may have slipped into sciencey jargon when I've just done the talk, which I apologise for as and when I did. Um, I'm sure I did. Sorry, um, but but it, it, I don't think there's any problem with the sort of synonyms that describe the the, the rough way. And then um, when you then go into the article and you look at the quotes from the scientists, they will have explained it hopefully simply, but in a perhaps more in, in the same, in the way that they would, the sort of terminology that they would use. But then there are also very, lots of very engaging public science publications. I remember as a kid, uh, I used to get New Scientist, for example, which was more based around um, uh, sort of science stuff, but sort of intermediate, not just nicely explaining things in a, in a way that I'm sure Reese has, comments on, on that as well is um from this point of view yeah i was gonna say I, i'd be inclined to look for the original press release that was put out by yeah. the organization so for example when there's a paper from our department or from the university or well from any department in the university there's usually a press release that goes out to the media that contains information about the new publication and it'll have the quotes in and maybe a picture and most of the time, the end product from the journalist reflects accurately what was in the press release. But sometimes they do pick up on maybe one sentence and go off on a bit of a tangent. So I think I'd be inclined to look for that original press release rather than taking every single thing you read on the internet at, at face value. And so, for example, from our department, we put our news articles on our website in the way that it's meant to be read. And I, I there is an example I can think of, I'm not going to go into detail of the paper, but uh, we had a news article, I think it was in 2018, and it got covered by the media, but they took one sentence and ran with that rather than the whole story. So yeah, I think my advice would always be to look for the, the original source. And uh, I'm guessing that most of these sort of online articles, there should be a link somewhere towards the bottom for this kind of thing. Yeah, you usually will find uh, at the bottom of the article or perhaps in the right hand column, the link to the original publication uh, or the link to the department website, for example, where the original press release was that's been the basis of that news story. So, for example, on, on our website, if we're, say a press release was written by the university, if we adapt it for our website, we will always have a link to the original article and we'll have a link to the, the journal publication as well. That was a really good question. I like that question. Um, and I, I guess uh, the other thing I wanted to ask was, so actin's kind of in, involved with the process of uh, muscle contraction. So um, when I get a twitchy eye, would you say that it's because the muscle is acting up? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. 
I'm really proud of that. I'm so proud of that. <laughs> I, I had one. Fun. I had one more question. I don't know if I can follow that. <laughs> <laughs> Please bring us back to the science. <laughs> I'm slightly disappointed that of all the acting related talks I've been to over the years, nobody has said that pun before. Uh, we I'm sure uh, it's been said. <laughs> well, we, we uh, for, for uh, in our group when we, we sort of the if we we're having a, a social uh, thing, we we had a calendar called Acting Out. If that helps. Is it acting out of interest when Matika's eye is twitching? Uh, to be honest, I don't. I. My gut is, I don't know for sure, my gut is that might be a, uh, actually the neuronal link to it, like perhaps, but I might be wrong. So some, I, I'm open to be corrected by a muscle expert on that. I don't want to quote it for sure. Okay, it's definitely got something to do with my uh, overconsumption of coffee as well, so. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, I, I, I guess more neuronal signals, but again, I, uh, I, that might be completely wrong. So apologize if it is, don't. Don't at me. <laughs> Phrase. Well, I because uh, we're we're running out of time. I have one one more final science question. Um, so you mentioned alpelacid, and yeah. I think I'm pronouncing that right, uh, which is an anti-cancer treatment that can potentially rescue the actin phenotype in Low syndrome. And um, so, I guess if you're wondering, could you explain what the next steps are for potentially that becoming a treatment for Low syndrome? Yeah. And it, as a, as a follow-up question, how did you decide? to focus on that drug? Because I mean, there are hundreds and thousands of anti-cancer drugs, so why that one in particular? Uh, I might be able to start with that last question. So that's the last question. It's slightly hard to answer without going into the full depth and molecular ex explanation. Um, basic, the, at a very basic front, um, uh, in our lab, we had a model of how this actin signal, uh, this actin happens. Um, and there were two um, membrane signals. Um, and it was already known that, to the, that, that, that there's two membrane signals which signals for the actin polymerization to happen. And it was already known one of those membrane signals is the one that's over, uh, basically, uh, low syndrome is uh, then to are caused by one of those signals being overproduced. Um, so, what we were trying to do, what that drug does, would have been one that would decrease the other of those two signals. So our, our idea was that if we could rebalance the signal, we, we can't do anything about this one being over, but if we can under, knock down effectively, reduce the amount of this second signal, we might be able to restore the balance of those two and thereby rescue the um, excess actin phenotype. So that's how we got to it. So, so that's actually what the drug is doing is it's, a, it's reducing the amount of this lipid signal that's upstream of the actin. I hope that was vaguely simple. In terms of what we're, we're hoping to do next with it is, um, so we, we, we've done these initial trials and, and shown some really nice looking results in mice. So now it's all about um, uh, interacting with the drug companies, uh, interacting with the patient groups, um, uh, and uh, potentially therefore, ho hopefully seeing whether this will actually happen um, this, this is a, a drug that, uh, because it's a disease that um, degenerates over time, targeting early in, in children is particularly critical for this. So that is the steps we're sort of building effectively expertise, groups of expertise so the people will be able to, and working out how to take this forward. So, so that's where it will go to next, but it's no, it's got, as yet it's not in any human trials for this purpose. Obviously, the purpose of cancer it's an approved drug already which helps but for, for this it needs to be properly uh, assessed as to we've got good preliminary data but yeah it's uh, still quite a few years off before it gets beyond that so that's where we're getting to with that hopefully uh, some content for a future cambridge festival talk yes cool um well, we're out of time, and um, so that was a really interesting session. So I'd just like to thank you, Jonathan, again for your very well presented and your beautiful uh, slides in your talk. It was fantastic. So thank you very much. Uh, I'd also like to thank Vatica for helping me out behind the scenes again. Uh, and finally, I'd just like to thank everyone who's watching this talk for joining us this afternoon. Uh, so hopefully we'll see you again uh, later on today for our next talk or tomorrow for our final talk for the 2021 Cambridge Festival. So thank you very much for joining us. Stay safe and we'll see you again soon.